and thank you so much for coming tonight. We are so thrilled to have such an amazing turnout. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Uh, my name is Catlin Moore. If you haven't met me previously, please come up and say hello. I'm the chair of the Southern California Chapter of Art Table, which you may or may not know is a national nonprofit organization for professional women in the arts. We have chapters all across the country, and I'm very pleased to say that we are the second largest chapter in the country with over 115 members. So, thank you. <laughs> At this point, I would like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Jory Finkel, who we're very excited to have be a part of this event. Um, just as a brief introduction, Jory moved to Los Angeles 10 years ago and is a journalist who has been writing about art for more than 25 years. She's currently the West Coast correspondent for the art newspaper and a regular contributor to the New York Times. Her previous positions include staff art reporter for the Los Angeles Times and senior editor of Art and Auction in New York. Jory's writing has also appeared in W Magazine, Art in America, Art News, and Flash Art, to name a few. And she's taught uh, at Stanford and Otis College of Art and Design. So just a few accolades to point out. <laughs> so without uh, any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Helen. Um. So speaking of accolades, I'm going to introduce our panelists, um, starting with Tim Fleming at my left. Tim is going to represent the entire world of art fairs on this panel tonight. Uh, no, no tall order there, but. Um, we have next to him Mark Moore, the founder and owner of Mark Moore Gallery, a gallery that has celebrated its 30th year in business last year. Exactly. And so he's going to tell us how to do it, how to stay alive as a gallery for 30 years. And I want to introduce Sarah Pritchard, who joins us from Christie's. She is head of contemporary art day sales at Christie's New York. Um, and last but not least, um, Suzanne Vilmitter is... Uh, is joining us from just around the corner, but she was born in Cologne, Germany, and moved to Los Angeles in 1990. She founded her gallery in 2000. From the beginning, the gallery's program aimed to represent an equal number of male and female artists. So I love that Art Table invited me to moderate or asked me to moderate. Okay. Get a little more. Um, a panel about mid-sized gal art galleries, um, because mid in the art world, and I think in our culture more largely, often gets ignored, uh, marginalized, overlooked, or just gets a bad rap somehow. Mid-career for an artist really means we don't know what in the world to do with that artist. Um, but our premise here is that the mid-sized art gallery is an important, if not always well understood, creature or animal in the art world ecosystem. Um, the other assumption that we're making is that we live in very fast changing times with a fast moving art market. Could you describe for us the biggest difference between running a gallery today and when you started 10 or 20 or 30 years ago? The biggest difference from when I started to uh, working in the gallery now is probably the uh, speed with which information is being exchanged. For the first time, I received a fax from Europe. That is a big deal <laughs> because that was real time. That was a document that was being sent in real time from Europe, and I thought that was remarkable at the time. That must have been around 95. Now, people go into the gallery and they Instagram or Twitter something to their entire following, and this image is being sent in a fraction of a second. That, to me, is probably the biggest change, and it means that Everything, uh, what we do, how we see art, how we sell it, how we talk about it, it's just a very fast-paced kind of event, and that affects every area of the gallery. Um, and 
I think there's one other major shift that I think is very important, and that is, I think in the last 10 to 15 years, um, the gallery model has changed very much from, um, and I think there are interesting parallels in the publishing world, in the music world, in any kind of uh, context where uh, creative talent is being developed or managed. And that is um, that artists want to have more control of their career, over their career, and they want to make important decisions about their career um, themselves or want to be at least actively involved. And that means that the gallery is much more put into a kind of competitive environment with other galleries. We have to work harder to compete with other galleries to earn the trust of an artist or to um, actually represent them in a way that they find appropriate. And that was not so, I think, 20, 30 years ago when the galleries were so powerful and the relationship to the artists were much more controlling than they are today. And I, I find this a very positive development. The other thing I would say that is, is tremendously different is the scale of the market. I think a lot of dealers right now are in very challenging times because we have very quickly evolved from a, uh, the, the corner record store where people would come in and ask advice on what we liked and what we thought and want to listen to music with us to all of a sudden being thrust into the iTunes world where information is disseminated very quickly and the personal relationships that used to be the foundation for most of us in the art world and our collectors in those dealers um, is really now done through emails and texts and phone calls and tweets and the um, in in our websites and um, uh, it's it, it, I, I would say in particular since 2008 it's been a situation where a lot of dealers who have failed to acknowledge and address these changes ha are, are no longer with us. The art world is not quick to, to pick up technology. Uh, I remember too when I first sent my first fax to Pace Gallery, Renato Danesi accepted the fax and told me that this is not a proper way to communicate with anyone in 1995 <laughs> and asked me to put it in a handwritten or typed letter and send it to him. <laughs> So there, the, the art world has never, for all of its involvement with the cutting edge and the avant-garde, yeah. it seems to be the slowest one mm -hmm. to evolve as a business model. Mm -hmm. Speed and volume seems to be the theme, um, and it amazes me how many people are so well informed about shows that happen in New York that I haven't even seen or been to yet, and they've never even been to that gallery, and how they're sent price lists and have spoken with the dealers intimately about the works and never been in the space, never met the artist, never seen the work in person. Um, and that's certainly contributing, I think, as far as the secondary market to the rise and increase in, in uh, the number of works that we are asked to offer. And I look at a lot of websites and we are making judgments over who's in the fair based on a variety of things. Uh, the idea is that we bring quality artwork uh, to the art fair. Uh, whoever you are as a gallery, you apply and you get in based on the presentation. How can you talk about the art market without talking about art fairs? I want to get your thoughts. Flash forward ahead to this time where you can't talk about the art market without talking about art fairs. Over the next five or ten years, do you see this as something that's going to continue to proliferate, where we're going to continue to see more art fairs, new art fairs, um, or is it time for the art fairs to consolidate? I look at a lot of websites and we are making judgments over who's in the fair based on a variety of things. Uh, the idea is that we bring quality artwork uh, to the art fair. Uh, whoever you are as a gallery, you apply and you get in based on the presentation. We first did uh, art fairs in Miami from 2002 to present. Um, a lot has changed. And this past year in Miami, I would have to say that if there was ever any doubt, 
definitely there are signals there that there is trouble in the art world uh, for art fairs just based on Miami. Um, you have now not one fair in a city like yours at one time, or maybe two, but you have 25 to 30 fairs going on simultaneously. An influx of people coming in through the increase in volume and attention. Uh, you may have three to 400,000 people coming into a city that is uh, not really prepared and doesn't have the infrastructure to deal with that kind of uh, uh, influx of traffic and what you see is complete and utter gridlock. The uh, people who are there, who matter to me personally, curators and collectors and, and critics, um, they're being priced out of the hotel rooms, they're being priced out of the restaurants, they're being uh, uh, limited to how much they can see because the traffic is so bad at that point. But I would say that the people that are coming into that city right now are there to party with Kim and Kanye and go out on boats and attend the parties all night. And um, it's a problem. And it's, um, uh, I, I, I kind of refer to it as uh, something like the Coachella Music Festival. To, to be frank, Miami now is unpleasant. The armory in that time of year has become very unpleasant. Um, and at the same time, every art fair organizer seems to be continually both expanding their market share by opening more and more and more fairs and more and more cities and raising their prices to the dealers that support them. Um, rationalized on the amount of tenants they have, their costs have gone up, whatever the case. Art fairs for me are, uh, are extremely expensive. They are um, taxing mentally and physically. And um, uh, a lot of dealers, I don't know if all of them sit down and pencil out what their costs are as opposed to what their income is from these events, but I would tell you from talking to them that a lot of them don't even really know they're losing money on each and every time they do a fair for most of them. I can tell you based on what I'm seeing there's a definite decrease in mid-sized galleries over the last five years and there's a definite increase in the number of fairs over the last five years. I believe there's a correlation between the two. Susan? For us, like running a marathon, that gets harder and harder, and the days get longer and longer the, towards the end of the fair. And you pay the down payment for a house in order to be admitted to this marathon. Yes. <laughs> and on top of it, the more prestigious the fair, very often the less the sales. So um, it's pretty hardcore. Whether one likes the fairs or not, they, are, they will not go away. They are becoming a more and more important tool to do business and to stay visible, um, particularly internationally. And I also feel that uh, very often for curators and important collectors, they are a, a very effective tool to go to one location and get as much information in the shortest amount of time and make all the connections. You can connect with all the galleries. You can see very good in the flesh examples of artists. It's a very efficient way to see a lot. There's art fair fatigue amongst all people involved, both on the collector as well as the gallery side. Um, so what I see is, is that the very large art fairs, and by that I mean Fries, um, Basel of course, and uh, FIAC, uh, each of these fairs have now multiple locations that those three groups will prevail and that I, I don't see much room for, and, and I, I don't see that the smaller affairs can effectively compete um, unless they are very specifically geared towards a very specific context. How many fairs per year do you 
do as a, as a Nine. So we're, our life is basically, if we're not at a fair, we're either preparing shipping for a fair or we're filling an application out for a fair or we're doing post work for a fair or we unpack uh, for work or we ask artists to produce works for a fair. Yeah. It's basically, yeah. it requires the financial structure and the staff to run another gallery at the very minimum. How many exhibitions do you run per year in the, in the gallery space? Uh, because we most of the time still do two exhibitions simultaneously, right. uh, we have about 18 exhibitions and nine fairs, so it's a lot of work. <laughs> Suzanne, have you ever sat down and actually penciled out if you didn't do the fairs? Yes. How would you have made money or lost money? We set up um, an income and expense category for each fair, so we could see, you know, did we break even? Did we lose money? Did we make money? Um, so we ha we have that information for each fair, and we continue uh, to participate in these fairs according to these numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, I should say that that never gives the entire picture because your visibility at an important fair, it doesn't directly translate into sales. I never go to a fair expecting to, it's not about making money, it's not a selling opportunity, it's a chance, basically it's a trade show. Basically, it's a chance to meet and greet people and hopefully connect with people, see work that you wouldn't see, meet dealers that you rarely see, mm -hmm. and hopefully a curator that bumps into an Alison Schulnick painting for the first time puts her in a show. Or so, and that's hard to monetize. Right. But it's those kind of things that keep the dealers coming back and doing nine fairs a year. And I would have to say your show budget's probably well over a million dollars just to do these fairs. And, mm -hmm. and at that point, um, uh, I would say a great portion of that budget is going to the art fair organizers. And, yeah. and uh, so basically... Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> if... if if I'm, if I'm not wrong, I mean, doing nine fairs a year, which is the equivalent on putting on uh, nine Super Bowls a year or nine rock concerts a year or whatever, I mean, it's a major ordeal. Mm -hmm. And you're gambling and hoping that you'll sell enough work to pay your expenses. That's sort of a model for treading water, isn't it? I mean, I, I think a lot of dealers do this at this point just because they program to believe that they need to or they're going to somehow fall behind. And I feel if a gallery does not participate in the major fairs, and by that I mean the FIACs, the Friezes, and the Basels, it is very difficult to stay competitive on that kind of level. You're talking about the risk of losing money or losing collectors, you know, losing money if you don't, if, losing money by doing the art fairs. If you don't do the art fairs, do you risk losing artists? I think there was a time that that might be a case. I think was I think that there are definitely artists that I've uh, uh, represent that I represent now or represented the past that one of the main reasons that they wanted to work with the galleries that we were very active in terms of our art fair presence and our marketing presence. I don't know that that's the case anymore. Um, uh, I made a decision this year not to do Miami after last year. This is the first time I actually uh, sat down, looked at the numbers and thought about it and made a decision I know what happens after 31 years of doing fairs. I'd like to see what happens one year where I didn't do a fair and see whether I end up with uh, more money in the bank at the end of the year than, than I have when I've been doing them. So we're actually uh, passing on doing all the fairs in Miami. And, um, uh, and, and I think that uh, there's some other dealers I've talked to that feel the same way and there's some artists 
that actually feel that art fairs don't do them any favors in presenting their works in that context. Art fairs come in all shapes and sizes. So <laughs> speaking for all art fairs for the moment, I will, I'll start with that. They, there's fat ones, there's skinny ones, there's regional ones, there's really smart ones, um, and then there's some not so smart ones. Every fair in Miami is not the same. Is it a curatorial space? I mean, where does art live? Where does art end up? How does art move? Art fairs are impressive on how much things happen. Uh, I do most of my business in the elevator going up and down. I used early on in trying to build the fair, I did a lot of business at three o'clock in the morning at the Kunstala in Basel, um, which I thought was a way to run my business. It's not now in year seven, but to meet people it certainly was. Um, I do a lot of business in the aisles of the art fairs, bumping into people. There's a lot to look at and write about as a, as, as a writer, I would, I would hope, although Jory's written some interesting angles on art fair over the years, uh, which uh, maybe aren't curatorial, but sort of are talking about the parameters of fairs and competition and, and business. But there, there, is a lot, there is a lot to look at. As a curatorial space, it's temporary. It's a four day, five day deal. It's in and it's out. The idea that this is where art should live, at least for a month, until it moves to a collection, or whether the gallery is placing in a museum, a lot of those things can happen at fairs. Um, and I think it's just a matter of pick your fairs, you know, pick your moments to visit, um, and you absolutely don't have to do everyone. Mark, Mark doesn't do our fair. Suzanne does. I think one thing we're talking about indirectly is how much we all love the gallery experience. Um, that there is, and of course not all galleries are alike, they come in all different shapes and sizes, fat and thin too, but that there is, there can be, you can remember very meaningful experiences and you can remember what you've seen. Um, but one thing that troubles me sometimes when I'm out and about looking at shows, I don't like to go to the openings too crowded for me to see the art. So I'm going during the day, usually in the afternoon, and I'm often the only person there. And sometimes these are really important shows, really important shows at your galleries or other galleries. And there are two of us at most in the gallery during the day. And you know, I feel it, it was very, um, the contrast was very dramatic to me when I moved here from New York because that was not at all the case in New York, whether they were the you know, galleries in Chelsea or Upper East Side. Um, and, I, and so I wanted to ask you about that, about would you guys agree, would you men and women agree, that there is a kind of crisis in terms of foot traffic in Los Angeles, in the gallery scene? You know, is it a crisis? Um, does foot traffic even matter to you anymore? You I'll just speak as an outsider because I'm from New York and I rarely come to LA this year more often than normal. Um, and I find it's extremely difficult because I usually get two or three days here at a time um, in between client visits to make it to downtown Culver City. I went to LA Louvre for the first time ever. I've been to LA seven times in the last year just because it's so far for me to do my job to be here and to make it there to see one show. Um, so I think that's a challenge in LA you don't have in New York. In New York, you can go to 10 of the best galleries in the world in one block. I view it as an impediment in the sense that it's very hard, almost impossible for any collector or auction house person to really get a sense of a gallery's program, identity, to become acquainted with the staff that works there, to develop a bond and a relationship when, unless you're seriously de devoted to going, and that's how sometimes I feel like the openings help because it gives some kind of structure and discipline as far as you have to make it here because you know you're going to run into all those people. And so even though it's never pleasant to view art during openings, it's a nice way to kind of force yourself to go. Um, and I think, you know, obviously I'm a native New Yorker, so just the space here is very daunting. And in a lot of ways, to be an advocate for the art fairs, um, it is a really nice way to see a cross-section of a gallery. And of course it is the buffet and you only get the sampling, but to have that sample you say, oh, I really like what I saw, and then you want to go back and you want to go and see the gallery, you want to become familiar with the program. You expect great things because you liked what you saw, even in a small sliver. 
I think we had a brief moment actually in LA where this whole dilemma of that it's so difficult physically to get from one space to the next, where that was at least partially eliminated. We had two moments, or actually three moments. It used to be all Santa Monica, then it used to be all Chinatown, and then it used, and then we had this brief Culver City moment where you could actually park your car and walk around and see po po probably about 10 galleries in one sitting. Now, of course, everybody has, is moving or has moved. It's decentralizing, uh, which is what very often happens after a period of concentration. It's, by the way, happening in Chelsea, too. Um, it's not as easy to see everything in New York anymore as it used to be maybe five years ago. In Los Angeles, because it is physically difficult to see everything, the gallery has to do much more outreach work, or we, put, we, we schedule events, or you know what I do a lot is, is that's why I'm emailing eight hours every day. Is I I invite collectors personally to the gallery, or I offer them works that I think they might respond to, or I actively reach out and, and my staff too. It's a very different way I think of doing business in New York, where you sit there, you have your rares, you have your beautiful show, and people come to you. LA, in, I feel, has never worked like that. Who is the gallery for? You know, is the gallery just for the collectors, the serious collectors, or is it also for a larger public um, that you know, might not have the money yet, might not have the education yet, not, might not have developed their eye yet? And how do you, you know, as gallerists, how do you think about it? One thing I just want to yeah. add quickly is it's funny because, you know, I have friends who work at certain galleries and you see the show, but every, even mid, sort of mid-sized galleries in New York will have extra spaces, huge, like three floors above their normal, very modestly scaled exhibition space for work that's new from artists that literally is there installed, ready to show. So if a collector comes in, yeah, they come to see the show, but hey, look at what we have upstairs. So there are two galleries, In our three levels, and there's one for the collectors and one for the public. We put on exhibitions for everybody. We put on exhibitions for students, for artists, for curators, for critics, for collectors, for anyone who wants to happen to come in. It's a public space, there's no admission, that's a given. But that said, the people who make that possible are the people who support our program and our artists. Mm -hmm. And if they stop supporting the program and the artists, then th that gallery ceases to exist. We very much appreciate everybody coming in. Um, but the exhibition also functions as a very, very important opportunity for the artist and it's it's this going from this emotional very private thing that you do in your studio for you know sometimes some artists work three four years on putting a show together and now all of a sudden it's public and anybody can see it I, I would say that that's primarily the person we're doing the exhibitions for, yes, for the artist. I agree. Because I've had people ask me before, says, well, with all of these expenses and from everything I've seen in the art world now, why don't you just close your space and you could sell all the, well, because if I closed my space, I couldn't do shows for the artists. Then I wouldn't have any artists. Then I don't have anything to offer anybody. So it's the, the I think, the major difference we've seen over the last 30 years is that exhibitions have become less and less important and less and less attended for whatever reason. And the people we're really doing them for at this point is for the artist first and for the curator second. Everybody has their passion, why they are in the art world. I know for myself, it's the passion is in doing the show and everything that has to do with it from uh, developing an idea for the show for the show with the artist and then arriving together at a selection of the works to how these works are installed that's extremely important to me that that's the only part in the gallery where where this running a gallery is like something like a creative act 
It's, it's figuring that out in collab collaboration with the artist and to create this, you have the different artworks, but then the way you install them or the way they kind of correspond with each other, that's when the music all of a sudden appears. So if you take that out, then I really do think that there's no, there's no difference to you know, what an auction house or what an art fair does. Yeah, um, you, 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 you all, I mean, there's a few rules for art fairs, and the nice thing about running an independent fair is we can make our own rules, but we stick to a few of them, and one is you, you don't get in unless you have a gallery space. So if Mark were to close, then it's a no. Uh, you, you need a space, you need to have a place in your community supporting the artist and doing the work. It, it's interesting that, uh, I mean, in talking about all the changes in the art world, one could conceive of a model if it doesn't already exist with dealers representing mid-career artists with very small brick and mortar footprints and a huge web presence and probably be very successful in doing so. At the same time where I'm seeing larger dealers, the mega dealers, go in the opposite direction. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like there's any end to how many square feet of space Hauser and Worth or Larry Gagosian <laughs> seem to need or want. And once you have a 100,000 square foot space in the art district in LA, as they're building now, how do you program that? What do you do with all that space? You don't even have to live in Los Angeles to have a gallery here, because most of the things are just always going online. I thank the panelists for coming tonight and having that conversation with us. Um, so.